Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, depending on your time zone. I am Anita Zanella. I'm currently a researcher in uh, ENAF in Italy, and I'm very glad to discuss with you about the contribution of high redshift uh, star forming clumps to bulge formation. I will start by uh, putting this work into context uh, to set the stage and be all on the same page. And then I'll move forward by discussing some of the most recent results that we have been obtaining. So galaxies in the local universe, star forming galaxies in the local universe, have typically regular morphologies with the spiral arms and the central bulge as the one that you see here in the, in the picture. They also have a relatively low gas fraction between 5 and 10%, and they form most of their stars into giant molecular clouds that give rise uh, to young massive clusters and all the star clusters that we see in local Milky Way-like galaxies. However, if we look at star forming galaxies at high redshift, let's say around redshift 2, where the peak of the cosmic star formation rate density is, the picture is quite different. So the star forming galaxies, which are typical progenitors of Milky Way-like galaxies, have irregular morphologies. They don't really show a central bulge, but their structure is dominated by these bright blue patches, which are typically called clumps. So in the following, I will discuss uh, the star forming regions, which are called clumps, and their possible impact into the evolution of the galaxy and in particular for bulge formation. So the question is, how do we go from the regular morphology that we observe as redshift 2 to the regular morphology that we observe in the local universe and how bulges are formed in this structural evolution of the host galaxy? So clumps are UV bright star forming regions that are indicated in this uh, picture with the, uh, with the circles. They seem to have stellar masses between 10 to the 7 and 10 to the 9 solar masses and sizes of about 1 kiloparsec or less. The sizes that we measure are typical, uh, typically are upper limits as the clumps are unresolved even with the Hubble Space Telescope. And we will need the next generation of telescopes like the JWST or even better the ELT to be able to start resolving clumps and actually determine their size. Before the um, advent of the next generation of telescopes, we can probe clump sizes uh, to smaller scales by using uh, gravitational lensing. And this has been done in a few cases. So it seems that clumps might have substructures. They might have a bit smaller uh, stellar masses between 10 to the 6 and 10 to the 8 solar masses and sizes of hundreds of parsec. Still, they seem to be more massive and larger than the typical star forming regions in Milky Way like galaxies in the local universe. So, there seems to be quite a different uh, structure, and the, the physical properties seem to be different for what concerns the clumps at high redshift and the local star forming regions in the local universe. So, the question is how do, do clumps survive? Are they scaled up versions of local star forming regions? and how do they contribute to the formation of the bulge and the evolution of the host galaxy. So simulations predict two different scenarios depending basically on the stellar feedback recipe that they adopt and on the gas fraction that they use at the beginning of the simulation. According to the first scenario, it seems that clumps, which are active sites of star formation, are quickly disrupted by stellar feedback in timescales which are shorter than 50 mega years. So according to the simulation, clumps do not contribute significantly to bulge formation. There are, however, different simulations indicating that instead, clumps can survive bound as bound entities to stellar feedback for hundreds of mega years. And in this case, they could both migrate toward the center of the galaxy, but also funnel the gas towards the center and contribute significantly to bulge formation. So the second scenario is highlighted by the snapshots that you see here in the slide. Going from left to right, you see the evolution of a galaxy. Uh, you see the edge on disk and the face on disk as well. So in the first snapshot, the galaxy starts to fragment, the disk starts to fragment due to the high gas fraction and the turbulence. And as time goes by, the first clumps are formed, uh, which are these uh, uh, bright white knots. 
and uh, they start to migrate towards the center of the galaxy due to dynamical friction and gravitational torques. At the center of the galaxy, they coalesce, and they also keep bringing gas inward, so they also the gas keeps uh, um, uh, coalescing, and this starts to form a central bulge and also thickening the galaxy disk. So in the last snapshot, we end up with a spiral galaxy, which has a central bulge and a thick disk, a bit like the local Milky Way-like galaxies that we see in the, in the local universe. So observationally, it is important to distinguish, to distinguish which one of these two scenarios is the actual one. And to do so, we need to constrain what is the strength of stellar feedback and also what is the lifetime of the clumps. So this is what I'm going to discuss in the, in the following. Trying to answer these questions, we gathered the sample of about 50 galaxies that ratio between one and three, which have been observed with the, uh, the, with the HST, both in the imaging, so we have rest frame optical and UV um, images, and also we have specially resolved emission line maps, in particular O3, H alpha, and O2 emission line maps. So we identified clumps both in the imaging and in the, in, the, in the continuum and in the emission line maps. And we use this sample to constrain clumps fate. So what you're seeing here is a plot where I report the age of the clumps in the y-axis and their galactocentric distance in the, y, in the x-axis, where the galactocentric distance is estimated as the ratio between the distance from the galaxy center and the effective radius of the galaxy. So there are a few points that I want to make with this plot. The first one is the fact that we have some clumps with relatively long ages between 300 and 500 mega years. So from here, it seems that at least some of the clumps in our sample are long lived. And then the second point is the following. So according to the second scenario proposed by simulations, if clumps are long lived, they are expected to migrate towards the center of the galaxy. So in this case, we expect older clumps to be found preferentially in the center of the galaxy. So we expect a negative age gradient with the galactocentric distance. And you can see this with, the, uh, with these um, green crosses, which are predictions with some simulations which are seeing clumps migration. Our points, our clumps, are the gray data points in this plot, which are instead scattered uh, around the whole plane. So we do not observationally see a clear gradient of age with the distance from the galaxy center. So a clear sign of migration at redshift two from our sample is missing. We compared with, a, with another literature uh, sample of clumps at redshift between uh, one and three, uh, similar to, to our own, which are these uh, uh, yellow points. So the selection of clumps in this literature sample and in our sample is quite different. We selected clumps based on emission lines. So we are probing also the youngest um, phases of clump formation, younger than uh, tens of mega years. Whereas in the literature, clumps are selected based on continuum, UV continuum. So relatively older stellar population are probed hundreds of mega years. Despite this different selection, it seems that uh, both in our sample and in the literature sample, at redshift two, there is no clump migration, which is evident. You can also see it here on the right hand side where this uh, literature sample is reported on average with this uh, um, with these black dots. However, they also have clumps at ratio one and 0.5. And in these two ranges, they start to see a negative age gradient as expected from simulations. So the question is why clump migration is not seen at redshift two, but it's seen at lower redshift. And there are a few possible reasons for this. One is the fact that um, Redshift 2 is a too early epoch to start to see a signature of clump migration. A second possibility is that the age estimate is too uncertain, and so the points seem to be scattered all over the plane. A third possibility, which is my favorite one, is the fact that the spatial resolution is not enough to probe the central regions of the galaxy, where the gradient is expected to be the steepest. So to really clarify this point, we will need observations with better spatial resolution to really probe the central kiloparsec of the galaxy 
and see whether indeed a, a negative age gradient is observed even at redshift two. So this will be possible with the next generation of facilities such as Mavis on the VLT, but also then JWC and uh, the ELT. And then the last point I want to make with this plot is the fact that um, at odds with, the, with other uh, literature samples that selected their clumps based on continuum, our emission line selection allows us to have a family of very young clumps with ages of tens of mega years. And we can use this young clumps to give a statistical estimate of the clump formation rate, namely the number of young clumps which are formed per galaxy and per giga year. We find that uh, we have about 10 clumps per galaxy uh, in the Lomas bin and about two massive clumps per galaxy which are formed each giga year. And we can pair up these numbers with the average number of clumps per galaxies found in our sample. And we at this point, get a statistical estimate of the clumps lifetime. So the low mass clumps live about 145 mega years, whereas the most massive clumps live about 650 mega years. So these lifetimes uh, are consistent with those uh, predicted by simulations indicating that clumps survive stellar feedback and might play an important role in bulge formation. However, the next question is understanding what happens for clumps with masses which are smaller than 10 to the 8, so really the lowest mass clumps. We expect that, that at some point their feedback is too strong and clumps cannot remain bound for long time scales. But we need to check this with observations. And to test this, we consider the clumpy galaxy at ratio 3.5, which is lensed by four ground galaxy cluster. So you see this clumpy galaxy here, labeled as A1. We see three images of the same galaxy, thanks to uh, lensing. And indeed, thanks to the magnification, we can probe these very low mass clumps, which have masses below 10 to the 8, and uh, uh, relatively low, uh, small sizes of hundreds of parsecs. So you can see two images of the same galaxy across the critical line due to the lensing. So we have many observations of different wavelengths. You can see the Lyman alpha, uh, which, is, which are uh, these uh, black contours. So Lyman alpha is extended much more than UV, which is the background uh, image, and the UV is coming from uh, HST observations. We also have H beta and O3 emission, which is detected and reported here as the white and blue contours, and many other emission and absorption lines. So what we see is that we basically have a central galaxy observed in the UV with their um, three uh, clumps. And then the Lyman alpha emission is much more extended uh, uh, than the UV as observed uh, routinely at this, at this redshift. So the idea is that likely there, is, uh, there are stellar outflows coming from the clumps and uh, that can be probed by the Lyman alpha uh, shell uh, and the Lyman alpha expanding uh, gas. So by modeling the Lyman alpha uh, spectral profile with radiative transfer models, we could uh, uh, estimate the expansion velocity of the Lyman alpha shell and the neutral hydrogen column density. So we could estimate the so-called mass loading factor, namely the ratio between the outflowing mass and the star formation rate that is ongoing in the clumps. So this basically tells us how strong the stellar feedback produced by the clumps is. And we, compare, we can compare our observational estimate, which is the cyan curve, with predictions from simulations adopting different recipes. So adopting strong feedback with a mass loading factor of 3.5, medium feedback, or weak feedback. So our observations are consistent with the strong and medium feedback recipes. So this seems to indicate that mass loading factors for, clump, for low mass clumps are between, range between 1 and 3.5. And this also implies that clumps consume their gas on a time scale of tens to hundreds of mega years without considering gas replenishment from the disk. So low mass clumps seem to be significantly shorter lived than the most massive ones. 
So to wrap up and summarize, what does this tell us about the formation and evolution of galactic bulges? So it seems the clumps lifetime depends on their mass. The most massive ones survive for hundreds of mega years. The lowest mass ones live for tens of mega years. So this supports the simulations indicating that the most massive clumps are long lived and might contribute to bulge formation. Whereas the lowest mass ones are disrupted by feedback and cannot be bound for long time scales. Clumps migration or ratio two is observationally still unclear and debated. More observations are needed to understand whether at redshift two signs of migration are observed and lower redshift clumps seem to be migrating. And in any case, they could um, funnel gas inward through torques and in this way feed the bulge. So it seems that clumps might be a viable uh, channel for bulge formation together with other mechanisms such as uh, mergers. So I'll stop here and uh, thank you.